This week on Make Better Wealth Decisions, elder care, what have you done to prepare for having your parents or grandparents move to a home once they become old and or incapacitated? What have you done to prepare financially? What needs to be done? Do you have powers of attorney in place? What contingency plans do you have for making sure there's someone to care for them if there's no one else around the neighborhood when they're older? A whole bunch of things that are really important financial decisions that most people never, ever think about. Make Better Wealth Decisions, a podcast that explores how financial advisors' blind spots can harm your investments. I'm your host, John DeGuy, a portfolio manager with Design Securities in Toronto. In this podcast, we'll provide advice on how you can achieve better outcomes by maximizing investments and minimizing taxes. Let's put our thinking caps on as we consciously decide to get smarter about our money. This week's guest on Make Better Wealth Decisions is Yvonne Dubroni. She is an elder care expert and has been working in retirement living for 25 years in various senior leadership roles. She continues to offer support through her consulting work and her consulting company, YCD Consulting. Yvonne, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is a bit of a delicate topic because no one wants to talk about taking the keys away from grandma. No one wants to talk about putting dad into a home. But here we are in 2024 and we have more seniors in Canada than ever before. And that trend will only accelerate going forward. I think my first question, therefore, is what can families do to prepare for the costs of retirement living if it comes to that? I think that's a great question because I think for the most part, most families are not really prepared for the financial commitments. And very often... What happens is mom and dad own their house, they're mortgage-free, but they still need to have cash flow to be able to pay their bills. And so when something happens in the family where maybe dad and mom are living together and dad falls and breaks his hip and uh, mom has just the early stages of dementia, what happens? And I think that family in general, they're not always prepared for the financial or the power of attorney documents, substitute decision maker documents. So it's a really elaborate question. I think in terms of financial, very often people are not familiar with what it actually costs to live in retirement homes, depending on the services, depending on the levels of services. They vary in price, but I think on average, you're looking at $4,000 to $5,000 for a studio suite, and that's without any care. And probably, I want to say around $4,000 to $9,000 for a one-bedroom and $6,000 to sometimes $10,000 or above for a two-bedroom, and those are services without care. So I really think when you put the care on top of that, it can cost up to $4,000 in addition to on a monthly basis. And dementia care, can it be more costly because of the over overview of the care and needs services? So I think in terms of family, they're not always prepared and they don't really know where mom and dad might have their finances So I just find in general, for instance, I had a call one day from a financial advisor looking for my mother. And uh, she said, I've been trying to get a hold of your mother because we need to update some of her investments. And so I called my mom and I said, mom, is there something that you need to share with me? She said, oh, don't worry about it. I've got it all under control. But this is also what happens is that people keep information close to their chest, but then when there is an emergency or a crisis, the family isn't sure where those investments lie. So I think in general, people do some research, and I think a lot of families that I have come in contact with over the years, they have been prepared. They have sat down with mom and dad. They do know where the will is. They do know where the power of attorney documentation 
is they have been appointed powers of attorney, but there are a lot of families that don't and they react in a crisis situation. A lot of financial advisors are, are using themselves getting a trusted contact person designated within their practice for their clients in general, and in particular for their senior clients. And it's ironic that we're having this conversation because I was just uh, visiting my mother over the Thanksgiving long weekend, and we updated her power of attorney. And my sister and brother-in-law are, are the joint POAs for both property and personal care. And we had to have a decision, a discussion about whether or not we should have a, a DNR, a do not resuscitate, and, and those elements of a, of a so-called living will. So all of that has to be discussed. And so I'm living with it right now. And the most, more recently, I was just uh, in the national capital region over the weekend and my best man, my buddy, who was uh, the best man at my wedding, has recently retired from the federal ser civil service. His mother is in her early 90s and she's living at home and she has dementia and she has incontinence. And he has gone from being a full-time employee to a more or less full-time caregiver. Now he has public service, public sector workers coming in on a daily basis to assist him. But the, the primary role for caring for his 92 year old mother rests on his shoulders. And he, here he is just recently retired in his sixties. Didn't think he was, his original plan was that he was going to go travel the world and see the sights and, and enjoy his retirement. And instead he's sequestered at home having to deal with things that are rather more immediate. And a lot of people never think about how that might be part of their reality down the road. So what happens when a family member doesn't have the funds for retirement living? You've laid out how it could cost anywhere from four to $14,000 a month. What do you do if you and your family just don't have those kinds of resources to deal with your loved ones and they need care? I think, unfortunately, sometimes you have to sell your home in order to be able to afford retirement living. Or if you have a cottage, sell that, sometimes both. And I think there are alternative options, which is to get on a list for long-term care, because that's government subsidized. So it is definitely more cost-effective, but there are long wait lists for long-term care. And you do have to go through the assessment process first. So the assessor can determine whether or not you're applicable for long-term care. If you remain too independent, then you may not qualify for long-term care. So unfortunately, it's unless you have a cash flow or you have a way to pay for retirement living, then when you can't, you can't afford to have the caregivers coming in. There are services that are offered where you can have up to four hours of care free from the government, but you do have to gain past the assessment. Right. And it's typically light housekeeping and help with certain things. So it's going to be a challenge for people who don't own a home and don't feel ready for long-term care. Because it's so a very difference. What about the situation where both the, the husband and wife are living in a family home and only one of them needs to move into a home? If you... The solution you just provided a moment ago, selling the home doesn't necessarily work because the one who's not moving into a retirement home or to an assisted living program needs to live somewhere. And I suppose that child, that older person uh, might be able to live with one of his or her children, but that might not be feasible any uh, either. So what do people do when one of the two needs to move into assisted living? The only way to pay for it is to sell the home. And the one who doesn't need assisted living still needs a place to live. In a difficult situation, I think it just depends on family in the scenario. But uh, very often, like you said, the family members have to then take mom in or help her find an apartment and then monitor her. I know this is very difficult for families because they have kids, dogs, jobs. And the last thing that they are looking forward to at the end of the day is making sure that mom is okay. If I have an acquaintance that I know in the neighborhood who's 92 and his wife has dementia and he just is in denial. She definitely needs to transition, but he doesn't want to let her go. So he's getting frustrated and he's certainly not capable 
physically and mentally at the age of 92 to monitor her and take care of her. Unfortunately, the children involved are all estranged. None of them are power of attorneys. And this makes it very difficult. And I think in these situations, it's so important to designate the powers of attorney, especially for care. Because when a situation like this comes up, like you had mentioned, the family can sit down together and have a discussion. What should we do? What's the best way to do this? Will you take mom for three months and we take mom for three months? Or does mom transition into date programs or whatever the case may be. And very often that's not the case, I find. Or one person's been designated power of attorney for care and the other two siblings have not. And so this also causes a lot of issues as well. I'd like to go a little bit further down that path, if I may, because make better wealth decisions is the sort of thing that a lot of people think is just about investing. And it it can be, but it doesn't have to be. It, it can also be about planning. And one element of planning is having powers of attorney in place. Could you offer your sense of how well used POAs are? What percentage of elder people would you say have a power of attorney? If you were to say at age 60, because some people would say, I don't need a POA. And I, I would argue you do because you could be in a car crash and be in a coma and you need a POA as soon as you're an adult. But let's say that by age 60, which at some point people might have a stroke and now, by now for sure, you should have gotten around to it. What percentage of Canadians in your experience have a power of attorney in place and what percentage are, are blithely going about their business thinking that it's the optimism bias story all over again, that for whatever reason, they'll never need a POA, so why get one? Yeah, I think people are in denial for the most part. We all feel like we're invincible. We're going to live forever. But I would say that probably more than half the families have not, that my experience has been, have not been prepared with powers of attorney. And so then very often it's a panic. Here's who's going to take mall, who's going to go to the hospital with dad. And I think you make a good point because when you look at all of the things that can happen, someone could be on life support. And there's no one to make that decision formally, or there isn't the funeral arrangements made. There's no executor of the will. All of these things are something that families really need to think about planning in advance of. But of mm -hmm. course, they always feel that their parents will live forever. They will live forever. But like you said, anything can happen and our, all of our lives can change at the drop of a hat. And I feel that they would really regret not having these things in place. And what about a passport? What if you had to hop on a plane to go on the mom in New York? Was your passport current? Mm -hmm. Things like that. I think Push people really need to look at a checklist of things that they need to prepare in advance of and label it. Where can it be found in the home right. or where do you store this? I have a file. And it's marked clearly, and my family knows where that file is so that they don't have to search. I've organized it all. And oh, I right. think this is really important because in a crisis situation, especially families are, their emotions are heightened. Right. And to dig around and try to find where investments are and wills and everything else is very onerous and stressful for them. So... Part of what I'm hoping to accomplish as a result of this conversation is to provide some case studies where people will say, oh, that, that could be me or that could be my family. So here's another one that I thought of. Let's say you have a situation where mom and dad are both in their mid eighties or early nineties and they're living together at home. And let's say dad is the primary caregiver to mom because mom is dealing with dementia. Most of dementia, it seems women are more likely to get it than men and it's related to hormonal things and what have you. So let's in this, let's in this uh, scenario say that it's dad who's the caregiver for mom. And then suddenly dad's, dad has a heart attack. And now dad is in the hospital. So you're, you've got your fix. You've figured out, okay, I know what we're going to, dad is fine. And dad, dad is able to take care of mom and they're living together and everything is going fine. And they don't have any problems. They don't need anybody to check in on them. And everything is working fine as long as dad is able to take care of mom. But dad's 85 and he has a heart attack and he's in the hospital. 
Now there's no one back at the family home to look after mom. What do you do then? Well, there, there are some resources. First of all, you'd probably contact an assessor to come and assess the situation in terms of health needs because you are entitled to some free care between two and four hours if there's staffing available from the government. However, that might take uh, a little bit of time. You could get home care company to come in to help mom temporarily until dad recovers. That can be costly. And I think one of the, one of the concerns that I have is very often residents or a family member will not want that caregiver to come in and give them help. They say, I'm fine. I can do it myself. Or they're, maybe they're not trained 100% in dementia care. So that poses a challenge as well. We can start the process for long-term care, but really it's very helpful if you do have the family members that can sit down together and agree upon a decision and say, this is what we have the funds to do at yes. this point in time. What's our next step? And there are services out there at a cost that will help you navigate through these systems. That can get quite pricey as well. Let's see if we can map out what that looks like. So let's say you actually have to apply for a bed in a long-term care facility. What are the steps? How long does it take? And what's the prognosis of actually getting a bed once you've ticked all the boxes and answered all the questions? You would have to be assessed first to make sure that you qualify for long-term care. And then what I typically suggest, they have a list that they would like you to choose long-term care homes that you would like your parent or loved one to go into. And I suggest up to five versus wow. three, but I think mm -hmm. it's mandatorily three. And I think you should tour those homes just to make sure that you're comfortable it's a good distance for you because visitation is really important to the resident, that you're fine with the surroundings, that uh, mom's comfortable, dad's comfortable with the surroundings. So I think that's really important. And it's important to know that when the long-term care home does put you on the wait list and you are contacted, you have 24 hours to accept that bed. Or if you decline the bed, you go back to the bottom of the list. And the lists are very lengthy as well. There's definitely a shortage of beds. And I think part of it is due to the fact that, like we mentioned, people are not prepared financially to always be able to afford retirement living. Long-term care is much more cost-effective because all the care is included in the cost and they determine the cost by your pension. So... It's much more reasonable. Mm. However, it's a totally different environment as well. And I think the caregivers, whether it's retirement homes or long-term care homes, do an amazing job. They really do look after the residents very well. Mm. The services that they provide are outstanding. I think it's also dissipating the fear with the elderly that there's nothing to be afraid of. Retirement halls, you can remain independent a lot of times and with assisted living, very little care or increased care, whatever your needs are, but you're in an environment where you're social in both long-term care and retirement halls. You're social, you've got structured meals, you've got structured programs. I think more halls are looking at more of a holistic approach now as well. So I just think that it's difficult because there's always that fear-based notion that, oh, retirement homes and long-term care homes are scary. So I think the family, it's important to bring them while they're well and able to tour halls so that they feel part of the decision. And I think very often what we do is we just speak for them and we don't necessarily take them along. And I noticed over the years, a lot of time when staff were touring family members and the resident was along, that they spoke to just the family. We need to include the parent to the loved one as well in the conversation. It's so funny because it does help. 
Yeah. It, it sounds almost like it's a sales process where it'll be uh, the children that'll be making the decision because maybe the parents are, are physically or mentally in, incapacitated. And so someone has to make the decision. And so as a result, the people at the, at the facility speak to the generation below and they may be a POA and they may have the best interest of mom or dad or grandma or grandpa at heart, but at any rate, mom and dad are right there. Like, why don't you just ask them? You don't have to do that. You said something a moment ago, Yvonne, that, that struck me. And you said that you could be, should be applying out of a surfeit of caution to as many as five different places. But when you get an acceptance, you have 24 hours to either say yes or no to whether or not you're coming. So let's say you have applied to five, but you've ranked them one through five and you get an acceptance from number three. And there are two others that you would prefer to go to, but you have no idea, A, whether they will take you at all, and B, even if they take you, it might not be until a year or two from now. And now you've been accepted by your third choice, which is not the best, not the worst, but it's there and it's available right now. What do you generally counsel people to do when they've got a firm offer in front of them, which, which may not necessarily be the best offer, and they need to make a decision in 24 hours. I think, you know, it's difficult for families to be able to envision their parent going to long-term care or retirement homes. But I think if you've actually seen the buildings and we somewhat understand the services and the way the building's set up, that I think most families wouldn't take the bet. And I think you can always transition to another long-term care home, you just don't know how long that wait oh. list will be. I okay. usually I didn't know try that. to, yeah, I usually try to let people know that they should take advantage of that bed at this time, particularly if they have issues with financing. It just seems like now they're in a responsible home, they're being cared for, they're being fed, their the services are provided. And it's cost effective. So why wouldn't you take advantage of that? And eventually you could apply for another retirement hall to see if you can transition. So to care home, sorry. I, I wanted to go back to what we were talking about a moment ago, where let's say the person stays at home and a PSW, a, a personal social worker comes in on a regular basis. Uh, how many people would you say try soldier on to live with mom and dad or grandma or grandpa at home uh, because the the stereotype is that there are a lot of kids that just want to get their parents or grandparents off to a home as quickly as possible but there are also uh, stereotypes of absolutely categorically not we you know we will as long as my parents uh, are at all able to live even semi-independently we will do that we will not institutionalize our, our loved ones so Maybe you could walk through what is offered if a PSW is coming in on a regular basis. Well, I think it just depends on what the needs are of that person. Maybe they need a shower five days a week. Uh, maybe they need help with eating. Uh, maybe they need a companion. There's a variety of services out there from home care companies and as well uh, after they've been assessed. There's slight housekeeping. There's a whole array of different services. But I think there are families that are very traditional in, in their thinking and want to be able to keep their parents with them for as long as possible. And I find that it really does put a stress on the family themselves. Mm -hmm. Their intentions are really great. I know one family where the grandmother lives with them still and the grandmother's 96. And she is somewhat high functioning, fairly self-sufficient. They don't want to leave her alone in the home. So there always has to be someone there to monitor while someone goes out to get the groceries. Yeah. And that isn't always, they're not always able to do that. So I think it's a lot of responsibility for the family. And I also find that as much as you love your parents, you can get very short with them as well. And I find that caregivers in general are, have much more patience because you've lived with your family your whole life and now you're looking after them. And I think there's so many different aspects to it, but I, I love the family that have the big hearts that do want to keep their parents, do want to monitor and help them with services. But 
at the end of the day, is it the best decision to make for yourself? Because you get Thanks. caregiver burnout. And this is why retirement communities offer respite stays so that the caregiver have the opportunity to just have a little break, have a little rest. Maybe it's for three days. Maybe it's for 30 days. Sure. The challenge there is always, you know, convincing your loved one to go because they're afraid that they're going to be left there. And so again, it's conversations, I think, when before, long before people get to this point, I think are really important. So you sit down as a family and you have those discussions and and then determine things together before mom loses her memory or dad's incapacitated. And right. to make them part of the journey, I think is very important. Great. That's a nice uh, thought. And I think it's a good way to begin to wrap things up. My last question is always the one that I ask, and that is make better wealth decisions is something that involves a whole variety of decision-making. What advice would you give to my listeners that will help them to make better wealth decisions when it comes to long-term care? I think, as mentioned, I say that there can't be any secrets. You have to have everything out in the open, just like I do. I have my little box and I have my investments. I have my will, powers of attorneys, executor of the will, all of those things are really important. Funeral arrangements. I know a family that had to make funeral arrangements last moment. It was an unexpected passing and it was very stressful and very difficult for them. And uh, they did an amazing job, but at the end of the day, why not have that all prepared so that your family in a stressful situation when something does happen, just have to refer to your notes or your files and it's easier for them. Yes, that's, I'll, I'll be doing that in my practice as well. Yvonne, I want to thank you for your time today. It's been wonderful and it's been insightful. I learned a fair bit. Thank you very much for having me, John, and I hope I've been helpful. John Degui is a portfolio manager with Design Securities in Toronto. The views expressed in this program are not to be construed as specific advice. It is recommended that you consult a qualified advisor before taking action. His books, The Professional Financial Advisor 4, Stand Up to the Financial Services Industry and Bullshift are available through Amazon and in bookstores throughout Canada. You can reach John at 647-STAND-UP. That's 647-782-6387 or at jdegui at designedsecurities.ca.